do you believe any of this uh, data that suggests people are getting smarter over time anyways? Is that what the Flynn effect is, that the people just get smarter? So the Flynn effect is the observation that IQ scores on average have very slowly been going up over decades, about three points per decade. This is not an, uh, an effect on, a, on an individual person. It is average data. And the reason for this is not completely clear. It's been known for a long time. And the reasons in general, there's probably multiple reasons. Better general health, for example, better prenatal care, things like Sesame Street and young children. We've written a lot about the Flynn effect. Um, it, it's, uh, we've reviewed it in, in uh, my books. Uh, it's, a real, it's a real observation. There's also some relatively new data indicating that the Flynn effect not only has slowed down, but may be reversed. This is very controversial. It's country by country. Uh, there's data from around the world. Uh, it's an effect that's been found around the world. The, the scientific question has always been whether this increase in IQ scores is an effect of the G factor which is the general factor of intelligence and accounts for half of the variance in IQ tests, or whether it is some other factor. So, for example, uh, kids now playing computer games very young get a lot of visual spatial stimulation. So that might be uh, contributing to the increase in IQ scores. But IQ scores from standardized IQ tests are a summation of a number of different subtests. And the G factor is what's common to all the subtests, irrespective of their content. Is G factor m measurable, or is it something that just kind of emerges from repeated testing of various other abilities and is uh, just, a, uh, what's it called, an emergent factor? Uh, it seems to be an emergent factor. It's not directly measurable, mm -hmm. like uh, distance or volume. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, if you weigh, uh, the, the example I always give, if you weigh uh, 200 pounds, you weigh twice a person who weighs a hundred pounds. But if your IQ is 140, you're not twice as smart as somebody with an IQ of 70. It, it's not that kind of metric. So the G factor really is estimated from, um, a battery of tests of mental ability. So if you think about all the different possible tests of mental ability, spelling, arithmetic, picking winners at the racetrack, I mean, just make up any mental ability that people have and sample any random eight. They're all, those eight tests are all highly correlated with each other, irrespective of their content. And that correlation is always positive. Tests of mental ability are always positively correlated with each other, sometimes strongly, sometimes weakly, but you never see negative correlations. That's called the positive manifold, and that's the principal evidence that there's a G effect, that there's a G factor that's common to all those. And I, um, an IQ test is a good estimate of G because it samples from different mental domains. And uh, statistically, the G factor accounts for about 50% of the variance in IQ scores. So it's, a, it's, it's the single most powerful uh, factor within uh, what we call intelligence. And most intelligence researchers focus on the G factor or on uh, the visual spatial factor or on a numerical factor. Those things can be separated out as separate from G, but in any predictive situation, most of the, predict most of the predictive power you get uh, comes from the G factor. So if you have a test with very low G, it doesn't predict much. Uh, and there are some tests that are highly G loaded, and those tests tend to be very predictive. But it's not a measurement where uh, you can double a score and say somebody is twice as smart. 
Well, well as far as I can tell, it's not a measurement even the same way that something like IQ is a measurement where there's a standardized test that you take and get some kind of outcome. Like G seems, is it squishier than IQ? Um, squishy, I wouldn't describe it as squishy. It's empirical. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's derived by factor analysis. You can rank people on a G score. It's just, is it just more complex to derive because it requires a battery of tests and therefore is less frequently used than something like no, IQ? Because uh, I hear people talking about IQ a lot, but I don't hear people talking about G very much. That's right. IQ in the vernacular means intelligence and, uh, in, you know, in common usage, but intelligence uh, IQ really should refer to a test score, and it really sh should refer to a test score from a standardized battery. So if you go online and you take, quote, an IQ test, that's a score. It's Are, really funny that you say that because it's, I hear a lot of people talking about IQ, but if it's just the result of a standardized test of some kind, it's very similar to people bragging about their SAT scores. SATs are intelligence tests. Uh, so the, your combined SAT score for math and verbal, that's a good estimate of your, of your G factor. And your combined SAT math and verbal score uh, is highly correlated with an IQ score from a standardized test. If you were to take you know, the SAT and an IQ test, they'd be highly, the results would be highly correlated with each other. Well, What's interesting about those, those, those tests is you can get appreciably better at them, at least in my own experience. Like when I, before I went to grad school, I was preparing for the GRE, right? And so I, you know, I took one just for kicks at first and did all right or whatever, just a practice one. But then I did, I think every Saturday for like 10 weeks, I, every Saturday morning, I just did a full test. And by the end of it, I could do it almost flawlessly. But I don't think that I actually got smarter over the course of that. I just became more familiar with the sorts of no, questions. You did, no, no. A couple of things happened there. You yeah. didn't get smarter, but the first test was a bad estimate of your ability because you weren't prepared. <laughs> Once you prepare and you maximize your ability, the second test was a much better estimate of your ability. So for example, if you take an IQ test when you have the flu and 102 temperature, you're not going to do very well. You take the test again two weeks later when you're fully recovered and you get a much better score. You didn't get smarter. It's just the score is a better estimate of your underlying ability. That's the way I, I think about it. Could I practice IQ tests the same way? And, you know, after having done a dozen of them or so, could I, you know, test myself straight, way up, yeah, straight up into the Einstein levels? Uh, no, okay. uh, unless the person, unless the test you're using always has the same items. And not only are, would you be familiar with the items and kind of know the answers, but you could do even better if you go online and, and find the items and, and learn the answers before you take the test. I mean, yeah, but it doesn't have anything to do with your, your ability. Yes, you can cheat. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can cheat. Now, it used to be these items were much more protected. But the uh, most recent new tests um, are such that they, they can generate new items for every administration. And mm. it's like the SAT. Every year, the SATs have different questions, but they test the questions to be sure the results are comparable from year to year. And that's what a good IQ test, and I know there's one in development now that will go online uh, relatively soon, uh, and they have been very diligent in uh, their ability to generate comparable items for multiple administrations of the test to the same person. Well, there's something about being familiar with the sorts of questions that you're going to be asked, even if the specifics are different. It's you, you just become after you've done 10 of these exams, you know, every week, you start to just become familiar with what a good answer looks like in the context of this type of question, I feel like.